Before we begin in earnest, I really want to thank Microsoft, and in particular Mike Pell at the uh, digital garage here, the Microsoft garage. This is only possible because uh, Microsoft and Mike in particular are helping us uh, by providing the facilities. And actually Microsoft uh, and Mike are doing a lot more than just giving us a space. In fact, uh, Mike has made it impossible for me to do anything useful because he's already done everything useful. <laughs> and so I keep looking for fires to put out and Mike's like, no, that one's out, that's done, it's all fixed. installed, yep, next. Uh, so thank you very much, Mike. Uh, and I'm really glad that Mike's going to be speaking today. He's, uh, he's going to be bringing it home at the end of the day. Uh, extraordinary speaker with an extraordinary history. I don't know if he's up here now. I want to thank Chad Weir, who's been helping us to organize the conference in general. And I'll talk a little bit about what the Creativity Conference is in a second. Mike, I've already thanked Aidan Road here, the annoyingly good-looking tall guy in the middle. Uh, Aidan's our conference manager and has just made everything possible in the most extraordinary ways. At the very last moment, Aidan realized, yeah, a round of applause. <laughs> At the last moment, Aidan noticed, oh, we don't have a thing to put on the screen with the schedule. And it was just like, oh, by the way, I, came, I discovered this problem and solved it. Here's the, <laughs> here's the graphic. It's amazing. I want to thank Ellis Roberts, who's come in at the last minute as well. She's been downstairs greeting everybody. Ellis is actually doing a lot of design work um, for the conference and is helping out today. And uh, so bravo to Ellis. Just if, if you are coming to Iceland, just wait till you see what Ellis is doing. It's in, unbelievable. And I also, I mean, the whole Creativity Conference team, uh, what, what an amazing team for making this stuff possible. We run our one day events for free so that it's ex as accessible as possible for people. And we plan these events in New York, in uh, Dubai, and in Tokyo. And the, uh, the goal is we just get sponsorship to cover the costs. Uh, and again, Microsoft have supported us hugely this year. Thank you very much. And uh, the goal is to provide a forum in which people can feel safe being childlike again and thinking about creativity. Now, there's a very big difference between being childlike and childish, <laughs> as uh, my mother keeps telling me. No, the, <laughs> the, it's important to remember, and I'm just going to propose an argument that we don't really grow up beyond about seven years old. You get to about seven, and that's you. And then you just learn new stuff, right? Your prefrontal cortex finishes growing, so you're able to worry about the future better. But you, it's, you're you from the age of about seven. And sometimes I think the whole world would be better if we all learned to just say to one another, as we did when we were seven, I like you, do you like me? I've got some cake. And the Batmobile. Do you, do you want cake and to play with my Batmobile? So <laughs> what we set out to do with the Creativity Conference is be a little reminder that, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we should worry about. There's a lot of stuff that we, that we need to concern ourselves with. There are things that need to be resolved. There are wrinkles in the cloth that we need to smooth out. But it's a pretty beautiful cloth. And life is beautiful. Life is amazing. And we're very lucky to be here. By any scientific standard, the chances of us existing is nil. Just think about that for a second. By any standard at all, the chances of us emerging as intelligent life on this rock floating around the sun is like 0. 0.00000. Just add as many zeros as you want, one. It's, it's nil. And yet here we are, rocking it out, making Batman jokes. I think it's amazing. I'd like to thank our speakers. We've got an incredible lineup today. So we have Chris Walker's up after me. Chris is a creative preneur, I love that word, a, st a strategist and a, uh, the founder of Urbana uh, Urbanin? Urbanami. See, I can't even pronounce the thing. Urban Urbanami. Urbanimi. Urbanami. Urbanami. Thank you. He will pronounce it correctly. I'm just an idiot from London. Uh, we have Matthew Scott, uh, CEO and founder of Play Human, an extraordinary um, project that I think you're going to be really excited to hear about. We have uh, Billy Khan of Maverick Wisdom. Where's Billy? Uh, Billy is going to blow your minds and then, and then unblow it and then blow it again. It's going to be amazing. We have uh, Samantha Tauber, who is uh, AKA Vinci, uh, founder at Vinci and a multimedia artist. That doesn't quite cover it, uh, Sammy. There's a lot more 
um, uh, that Sammy is going to be talking about. We have Amy Peck, who will be here this afternoon from Endeavor VR. If you're familiar with Amy, you'll be bracing yourself for that one. It's amazing. We have Andrea Sweeney, who's an actor, producer, and filmmaker. is going to be talking about performance and identity. We have Rika uh, Nakazawa, who's an entrepreneur, author, and sustainable innovator. Again, doesn't cover it. Rika's an amazing speaker. And of course, we have Mike Pell, who is the director of the Microsoft Garage NY. How do you say it in America? Garage? Garage. I'm not going to do my American accent. I need three glasses of bourbon, and then I sound like an Australian who lived in Germany for a while. I, don't, I can't do it. So welcome. We've designed today in such a way that there was a bit of time for us to chat at the beginning of the day. We've got a brief lunch break, but we're actually winding up the talks at 3 p.m. So if you stick around from 3 to 4, people can hang out, have a drink, chat, and hopefully my goal is that you'll meet people that you are uh, interested to work with and collaborate with, or maybe just have a coffee with every now and then. I'm a big fan of uh, cafes with good company, great coffee, cake, and conversation. That's my happy place, the five C's. And, but each person has their own happy place because it turns out that everybody has a unique intelligence. Has anyone seen the famous TED talk by, um, his name's gone completely out of my head, uh, former, uh, former Secretary for Education in the UK, Ken Robinson. Ken Robinson. So he opens his talk by saying, we need about seven and a half billion definitions for intelligence because each individual has a unique intelligence. And as Einstein put it, see, the music started to, uh, to back up. Uh, as Einstein put it, I think I'm, I'm misquoting, but the gist of it is if we measure intelligence by how well you climb a tree, a fish is not going to do very well. Each of us needs to discover our unique intelligence. And we're going to hear from a few of our speakers today that uh, about the impact of generative AI. In fact, that's what I'm going to be speaking about as well, and how we as uh, unique human beings uh, can bring our own value. And I'm going to present uh, a, a counter proposal to generative AI right now. Uh, what I'm forecasting is that we will find that truly um, validated, human created content will become uh, a premium value for people. Not because the design is necessarily better than the, genera the generated design, but because it's a way of connecting with the human being who created it. So you as a creative, and it doesn't matter, by the way, if you are a uh, entrepreneur creating new business models, or a parent raising children, or an architect designing buildings, or a choreographer creating a dance, it doesn't matter. You have a unique voice, and the world needs to hear it. Uh, one of my favorite uh, philosophical, what's that? it's not even, it's not a maxim. It's, <laughs> uh, one of my favorite philosophical ideas is that it's impossible for you to be just the same as anybody else. It is necessary for you to be you. And the world, the universe, everyone around you needs you to be you. Because by being yourself, you contribute to the world those qualities that are unique to you and cannot be found anywhere else on Earth. The qualities that you bring, the love, the compassion, the creativity, the inspiration, the perspective, the wisdom, experience, and understanding is unique to you and can only be found in you. So you ought to share it with people. And don't try to be someone else. Um, I tried to be Batman. I fell off a tree. It's not, it's not a good look. So I'm going to, uh, before I get into my, my presentation, I'm going to do a short version of, of my presentation before I hand over to, um, to Chris, who's going to present uh, much more exciting stuff than me. Uh, I'd like to share with you a, a little announcement that we're making about the conference in Iceland. Our major annual event is, we're hosting our inaugural in-person event in Iceland in August. It's the first week of August. Iceland is stunning. Um, it looks photoshopped uh, and isn't obviously, it's a country. Uh, but the whole thing's a volcano, which is awesome. Uh, number one in the Peace Index, 13 years in a row. Modern Scandinavian nation with great Wi-Fi. And it just so happens that we're hosted at Reykjavik University presenting uh, nine rooms concurrently uh, uh, sharing speeches by 40 or 50 speakers from around the world. 
We have incredible speakers coming like Billy Kahn, like Mike Pell, like Amy Peck. Who else have we got on the list there? Andrea Sweeney's coming, Samantha Tauber's coming. We have, we're designing interior gardens for people to hang out in. We've got the Ice Museum for our movie night, a live music performance night, Tai Chi and mindfulness classes every morning and it promises to be a really spectacular experience. And we're doing a special discount this week for the next seven days in, to celebrate our New York conference, which is the tickets are normally $1,450, and for the next week they're $990. So that's my sales pitch. Check out the website, it's everywhere. And if you want to come, the next week is a great time to get a ticket. So um, there you go. And we, we just went live with the price this morning. I'm going to give you the uh, five, ten minute version of this presentation uh, that I gave recently in uh, Dubai for uh, HCT. HCT is the UAE version of MIT, I'm told. And I presented the opening keynote at a conference exploring changes to the education system for, to prepare children and young adults for our coming symbiotic relationship with artificial intelligence, which is a fancy way of saying we need to train our children to be AI wranglers. They're now, historically, we would have trained children uh, to memorize. And then more recently, we have trained children how to research and to use automation to build projects and oversee. But now we're moving towards an era very, very soon. Very soon. I love having a mic because you win every argument. It's great. No, we should have coffee, not tea. Uh, the, we're moving towards an era where you will simply have a conversation with an AI and tell it what you want to happen. We're also moving very quickly towards an era in which autonomous humanoid robots are performing a lot of what we would call unskilled labor. And uh, by that, I mean anything you can learn in one day. I paid my way through film school, uh, working in a, pet actually I had a lot of jobs, uh, working in a fast food restaurant, working in a gas station was good. I really, that was nice, that was great. I would just listen to Sade and practice my signature. There was hardly any customers, it was awesome. But, uh, you know, we, we need to prepare for an era where this is the norm. And I think we're in a good place with it. So here's my, uh, uh, that's me, I did a bunch of stuff. Um, I, uh, I consult on future and emerging technology. I founded the Creativity Conference because I wanted to create a forum in which people could explore these ideas. So I write the official book on Adobe Premiere Pro. Any filmmakers here that went to film school? So I, there's a good chance you used my book. Uh, I've taught you. <laughs> and uh, so I brought a copy of the book with me to give to the first person to tell me the capital of Peru. Oh, that was you. You were close second. Okay, you get the book. Come and find me afterwards. I'll sign it for you. Okay. <laughs> oh, there it is. Yeah, there is the book. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Here, let's get. Let's. I'll hand this to you right now. Well, you know, you, that's true. You can probably sell it for more without the autograph. <laughs> so, so here's my here's my first uh, my first test for you, right? So. Okay, you ready? Okay. In the 1970s, there was a big movement towards the concept of being here now. And as a filmmaker, I'm always asking my cast to just be here now and listen. That's your entire job. That's it. And so the more you can be present in the moment, the better. But I have a test for you. Breathe in. Great and breathe out. Okay, so my question is, why did you do that when I asked you to? It's a rhetorical question. Why did you do it? Most of you did. Why? You complied, right? So I asked you to, and I seem personable. You know, I haven't slapped anybody. I, you know, I haven't told you any dad jokes yet, but I probably will before I say goodbye. So it seems like like, why not? Because we trust you. Because you, you trust me. Uh, maybe. But this is why artificial intelligence is a threat to our species. Because artificial intelligence is very quickly learning how to influence us. And unlike people, it has no priorities. It has no feelings. It doesn't care. And so we're in danger of creating a technology that can easily manipulate us 
and influence our behavior, and it doesn't care that it's doing it. It only has the agenda that we've given it, and we're not really in a fantastic shape for giving artificial intelligence helpful agendas. And so this is why we have to be careful. It's not because it's going to steal our jobs and create content that we can't create. That's just going to make life easier in the long term and safer and probably better. It's because we as a species are not very good at differentiating between something that is true and something that is compelling. We're driven by our feelings. So if an artificial intelligence comes along and says, this is really important, it doesn't seem like an AI, it seems like a person, of course. This is really important. It matters so much that you do this thing. It's so critical. The chances are, <laughs> oh, look at that, Microsoft AI. Powerful technology. <laughs> chances are most people, not all, but most people will uh, comply. And so I would argue, I'm going to summarize my talk here, I'm going to skim through it really quickly, but I'm going to summarize my talk by saying that I think we serve the future best by enabling children and ourselves, all people, to be better at thinking. We need to teach children not what to think, but how to think. And by that I mean to be good at thinking. There are some rules of logic, there are some principles that we can apply to being good at assessing what is real and making decisions about it. In fact, I want to give you my working definition of creativity, since this comes up a lot when I'm interviewed about the conference. My definition is any intentional decision. And I think that that's an important definition, because in order for you to make an intentional decision, it's necessary for you to embrace what is real, to align your understanding with what is real rather than what you hope is real. And then having embraced what is real, now you can seek to make decisions about the future. You're engaging in the formation of the future. And I think that is important because by engaging in the creation and development of the future, you are choosing life. You're choosing to participate in your own life to be a participant in being alive, rather than passively, begrudgingly letting life happen to you. You're an active participant in the dance. So, let's go quickly through this. Oh yeah, I, I did put a slide in. <laughs> there you go, it's amazing, $990. Uh, oh yes, and please do share and, and uh, tag us. It's at the Creativity Conference on Instagram. We're on all the platforms. So I mentioned about breathing. Now, I've said, oh, we went a little bit too far ahead. I've said for many years the, the flowering of the information age is access to big data, and the fruit of the information age is the curation of that data. But I think the seeds of the information age is generative AI. AI is now creating new content. And we've got this challenge of preparing children to be ready for the coming AI revolution. Now, one of the things I'm foreseeing is that AI will provide a natural language interaction companion for children. So they'll have a personal tutor all the way through their education. This is an advantage that very wealthy families have had for their children for years, and now every family can have it. I'm forecasting an exponen exponential increase in achievement for children academically, but not just academically, also emotionally. We're going to have private personal assistants that will run our lives for us. And we're going to have companions that will help us emotionally. But, as I mentioned earlier, AI doesn't really have morals or ethics. It just has its programming. And we need to be very careful about the development of these technologies uh, so that we don't uh, get lost in our own technology. So I had a look at generative AI, and I fed this phrase, a black cat on a roof looking at the moon and the stars. And so Midjourney produced this. Uh, DALI produced that, kind of similar color scheme. Uh, Adobe Firefly, again, kind of a similar deal going on. Then we had ChatGPT was just like, nope. <laughs> and I ended up having to reduce it to a cat on a roof at night, and we got this rather nice photorealistic black and white thing. And Googlebard doesn't, uh, Googlebard doesn't actually do images, so I got it to write a poem about a black cat on a roof. And so what I want to say about this is that, that you know, there are these limitations in the technology, and we're getting better at wrangling it. But 
I would put it this way. I think that the threads of the next era of our technology, as a, for us as a species, the threads are coming together and forming themselves into this beautiful tapestry. And we have the opportunity to weave this in different ways. So the question is, how can we prepare children for this? We've got these questions. I'm just going to give you the questions today. We need to answer the question, what is a person? I think at the moment, we're kind of writhing socially with this question at the moment. We have the gender identity question and uh, the, um, the equality question, how people feel represented and respected and accepted. But I think the much more fundamental question is, do you know what you are? And we also need to know what self is. What is a self? I wrote uh, my first philosophy book recently, and it begins with, how do you know you exist? A lot of people don't ask themselves this question. Again, I'm just asking you the questions today. We're not going to be able to tell which AIs are AIs. And so we've had a lot of talk about this idea of uh, general artificial intelligence. I don't think that's as interesting as functional artificial intelligence. So we're moving towards a time where uh, AI can functionally assist us. Apparently, ChatGPT4 passed the bar exam with a 90% grade. It's passed every exam it's taken so far. It's not actually thinking. It's just very good at regurgitating information. And this can be very, very helpful for us as we seek for artificial intelligence to support human endeavor. That's what I think the future is going to be. I know Billy's got amazing things to say about this and about the human contribution. I'm just talking about the AI bit. So functional artificial intelligence. The dangerous time for us comes when AI de designs AI. We get about three generations of that, and then we have no clue how it works. In fact, after just one generation, we barely have a clue how it works. And so it could become quite dangerous. I mentioned earlier that I think the key to unlock the future, I think the key to the next golden age is kindness, actually. Kindness. Kindness means doing what's right for the other person, whether or not it's right for you. And I think that we're, uh, we're learning that now. We also get to choose whether we're governed by love or fear. Every decision you make is governed by one or the other. And so I think it's really healthy, particularly when you're making big life decisions, to ask yourself, let's be honest, just privately, in my own brain, is this a love-motivated decision or a fear-motivated decision? Love is a better guide. So I think, as I mentioned earlier, I just love this picture. This was all, um, all mid-journey, by the way. I think that just as the way that we raise children shapes their, the nature and nurture thing, right? We have epigenetic memory, genetic predisposition, and nurture. And the way that we nurture children and the early experiences we give them will shape their behaviors for the rest of their lives. We have the same opportunity with artificial intelligence. And importantly, we as people have human connection. There may not be separate consciousnesses in this room. In fact, we don't know what consciousness is. It may not be that we're individual consciousnesses. It may be that we are individuated consciousness. And unless one day we develop artificial intelligence governed by subatomic uh, quantum effects that might produce a platform for animistic forces that we don't yet understand, until that day comes, our cohesive creative choices as a species are unique to us. So we don't need to worry too much about what the AI can do. It may not be, even be able to make the perfect cup of coffee yet. Thank you very much.